Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Apparently, this works well. My apologies if I've scared you. It feels like I'm in a booth. Um, my name is Tamara Tolzo Laughlin, and I am the North America Director of 350.org. And it is my pleasure to um, be the moderator for this panel of amazing humans. There's a little typo on the um, program which suggests that I would be on the panel and Jessica would moderate, which we were both really flattered by. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, it's my pleasure to bring an important conversation to the fore about energy equity issues in underserved communities, mostly because there is a misconception that uh, energy issues are issues of privilege, even though, uh, raise your hand if you uh, have an electricity bill. Raise your hand if you pay it. I'm not gonna come for you, I just want to know. <laughs> um, uh, but, but ultimately, like as much as we like to think that this is a high stakes, high level kind of activity, it is something that everybody participates in at some level. You are either the beneficiary of someone who is taking care of where your energy comes from, or you are someone who's directly paying for it, or you're someone who's being advocated on behalf by, by state agencies who hire people to argue both sides of a question. Uh, specifically in the case of Maryland, we have the Office of the People's Council, who is everybody and nobody's lawyer, which is one of the most confusing things I've ever heard, um, because they have to represent the general interest of keeping prices low and making sure that agencies that are, and utilities that are forced to pay for consistent, for punished, they are punished if they fail to deliver electricity, there's a whole system in place. The backstory on that um, is pretty colonialistic. Uh, ultimately, a couple guys carve up the earth. Some of them said, I'm gonna work on railroads and telephones and electricity and water. And we've been living with that system ever since. We've not really revisited the structures underneath it or how we define success or whether or not price should be the only measure of how we deliver electricity to people. Is this really annoying? It sounds like weird and like the sound. Is this a little weird? <laughs> Does it sound like I'm rubbing foil? To anyone yeah, other than, okay, yeah. yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna see if I can step away from it a little bit, which will be exciting for you guys. Is that any better? Yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay, good, because I was giving myself a hit. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that for the implications that energy has for all of us, we were not invited into the original conversation about how it's gonna work. So when communities say, I have no idea, I was not invited, my job is to pay the bill and keep my lights on, we really need to think about it as advocates and folks in this space because that isn't a totally appropriate attitude to take. So I was thinking that we could have a really great conversation about some of the things that are available now, some of the things that are being percolated in the state houses um, and the places where regulations and statutes spring from around what the options are for underserved communities in this moment. Because it is my sense, um, as someone who uh, has worked a lot on energy issues and environment and health, that we are in the middle of a moment that people will read about later and they'll say, oh, I remember when, the, I wonder what it was like when the telephone came to be. I wonder what it was like when someone had electricity. If I were around, I would have done X. And I think between climate change and the turnover of natural gas infrastructure and moving away from fossil fuels, hopefully to, to, to their extinction and not ours, and we're in a moment where people will look back and say, oh, I wish I had been there when, when we changed the way we do this business. So this is just a peek for those of us who want to be future forward and present now. And we have some incredible folks um, who are going to talk to us about it. Jessica Ennis is the Legislative Director for Climate and Energy at Earth Justice. Uh, Jeremy Richardson is a Senior Energy Analyst and Climate and Energy for the Climate and Energy Program at Union of Concerned Scientists. And Crystal Hensley is the Director of Government and Community Affairs at Community Solar. Um, I want each of them to spend a little bit of time talking about how they got here, just maybe like two or three minutes on how you ended up in this really uh, necessary and wonky kind of work. And then, and then we can, um, have a, we'll have a presentation from Jessica, then Crystal, and Jeremy. Okay, so do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Jess. I prefer a little informal. Um, so I've been at Earth Justice for about 11 years now, and I worked on our oil and gas bucket for a long time. But as these electricity sector issues have become uh, bigger and more important, uh, across the country, we decided to shift, and we've all. I had always worked at the federal level, and states are actually the places where a lot of the groundbreaking legislation is happening, particularly mm -hmm. on the electricity mm -hmm. sector. So in 2015, I started working on, well, actually in 2014, on the community solar bill that we'll be talking about a little bit more. So um, I come at this from 
we used to like go knocking on doors on the halls of Congress, um, but now spending more time in the states because that's where the really exciting stuff is happening. And I think it's really critical that the states set the because they are breaking so many of the boundaries on these policy ideas and starting new policies. They're kind of the lab where we're seeing what works and what doesn't work. So hopefully the feds will learn will follow sometime soon. Crystal. Um, my name is Crystal, and I've been in the community solar space for about two years. Um, I also have a federal background, um, working in a Senate uh, for former Senator Leader Harry Reid. Um, and of course, as a legislative aide, we have a pretty diverse portfolio, but my interest um, was environmental justice and climate change. And so um, once we lost a lot of seats um, in the last election, I knew I wanted to move closer to out of the office and more practical sense. And now I'm actually a boot on the ground um, in the communities and following Jessica's work, we actually have the legislation and now the real work begins um, and just taking up a con and saying, okay, this legislation is here, we have a pilot program, um, what are some of the ways that we can create awareness, whether it's partnering with different nonprofits, small business owners, and I will look forward to talking more about how community solar can be accessible um, for underserved communities, ways that the community can get involved, um, and we all bring this full circle. Jeremy? Thanks. Uh, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I've been at UCS for about seven and a half years. Um, I come from a, a third generation coal mining family in West Virginia, and uh, that's always been the lens that I see the climate uh, crisis through, is what does it mean for people like my brother who lives in the mines and people like myself, the place where I come from in West Virginia. So um, that, that's just sort of one of the things that I think a lot about in terms of policy is that as you're thinking about policy, but does it mean for actual people on the ground um, and how to make it work for, for everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, storage, energy storage when it comes to people. Fantastic. Apparently you want to just flip this. Oh, I don't care. So does anyone care if I pull the shades here? No, because that's probably that's better. Very for, right. yeah. My eyes are messed up now because you know once you get into your forties, like the struggle is real. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm just having trouble like <laughs> adjusting. All right, so thanks everyone for coming to this panel. Now raise your hand if you live in a high rise or a multi unit building. Yep, it's a lot of us in densely populated urban areas. So. Um, like, I also live in a high-rise building, so I can't put solar on my roof. I can go up and look at it, but I couldn't actually like, put a solar panel up there. Um, so I, that's why one of the reasons I'm personally really excited about community solar from my own perspective. Um, but how many of you have, I don't know, $15,000 just laying in a bank account to go put a solar array on your roof if you have uh, access to your roof? That's what I thought. So that is why I'm... Community solar is a great policy. So what it does is it allows people who live in a high-rise building, who are renters, who have a shaded roof, who don't have, who don't want to put up that much money up front for a solar array, it allows them to subscribe to a solar array that's somewhere off-site, but hopefully in their community. Um, in states like Maryland, which has a great, it's called net metering, um, where you get credit for a solar energy on your house and it, that gets credited to your electricity bill that makes it more economic for you. Um, that's a great policy, but only about 25% of Marylanders actually have access to that net metering because they're only about 25% of the state's residents can actually put solar on their roof. So groups identified this as a problem. It's not fair that only some people can actually access this wonderful benefit and have more control over their electricity source so people started thinking, what's the way that we can do this? And in around like 2006, 2007, people across the country started thinking about, well, let's see, we could build a solar array, like maybe on the roof of the church or on a community center or somewhere else and just have neighbors subscribe to it. And that way they're choosing solar energy and they get some of those ownership benefits um, of the array. So that's where community solar started. There, um, a couple of diagrams that help describe it, but it's basically like getting credit on your electricity bill as if the solar was on your roof, but instead it's off-site somewhere and you subscribe to it. Are there any questions about that first? Okay, cool. So Maryland was one of the early states that adopted community solar. These are 
the yellow states um, are places that have adopted policies. Blue are places where um, they're being worked on actively. And I'm actually not sure about Washington State. But Maryland was the, I think, the 12th state to adopt a policy. Um, it passed the Maryland General Assembly in 2015. And these are just some of the reasons why I really like it. So it increases access. It allows, since you're building an array that's larger than it would be on a rooftop, you get some of those benefits of economies of scale. Um, it's community-based. You, there are examples of people coming together with their neighbors to build these projects. So you're really taking power over your electricity bill. Um, they're much more flexible if you move and you stay within the same utility ter territory. You can keep your subscription. You don't have to redo, like put another solar array up. Um, there are also some great job creation benefits that I'm guessing our next panelist will discuss. And then it helps us to meet environmental goals. Maryland has some great uh, clean energy goals, and community solar is a way to allow more residents of the state to work together to meet those goals. So I'm just going to give you some cliff notes on the project, which I'm very excited to say this will be out of date sometime Monday afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. In 2015, uh, the bill passed. It created a three-year pilot project for community solar, and then it directed a lot of decision making to the Public Service Commission, so the regulatory entity that tomorrow was talking about. Um, the initial pilot actually ends this year, so luckily a bill passed just a couple months ago to extend that pilot, and the governor is signing it on Monday. So, and that just, we just found out about that this morning. So, hooray! It's um, 2024. Yeah. So. The 218 megawatt number will be outdated pretty soon, which is exciting. And so as part of the extending the pilot, the Public Service Commission has also been directed to add capacity each year. So we're not going to hit that ceiling. Um, you have to live in the same utility territory. So like if you live in BGE territory, the, the array has to be located there, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, and then one of the things that Maryland did that was really interesting is there were tons of public comments about the importance of making sure that all electricity customers had access to community solar. We didn't just want it to be people like in similar income ranges. So they basically created like a bucket system. So there were three sections of projects, the general uh, category, which was anything. And then the category that I think is most interesting and was an interesting way that the PSC thought about this was they created a carve out for low and moderate income projects. So those are projects that have, it's 30% of the total capacity, so 30% of what was 218 megawatts. Um, and then each project has to have at least 50% of its subscribers to be low and moderate income customers. And then of that, at least 10% have to be low income subscribers. So there are a lot of different, other states have tried different ways to make sure that LMI, or low and moderate income LMI, um, subscribers can participate and this bucketing system is one of them. Um, I will say it hasn't been the smoothest all along but I, this is where like learning and the extension of the pilot is really important to allow uh, people in the state to keep learning about it. So those are just some of the top lines that I just added this very last minute. <laughs> so the bill passed to extend the pilot through 2024. Um, and yeah, it will be signed Monday. So we'll have more time to figure out how Maryland can continue to be a leader in community solar. I think one fun anecdote is that other states are now using the Maryland um, bill as a model. So it's really fantastic to be in a state that is committed to making sure that everyone has access to clean energy programs. Do you want to do questions at the end or? Yeah, we'll hold them. Just we'll hold questions until the end. So that's a nice segue. Um, so once the legislation was passed in 2015, um, I came, I joined Neighborhood Sun last year, early February, um, and pretty much we're implementing the legislation, meaning we can actually, as open face to the public, subscribe uh, members of the community to various solar farms um, that's going to be developed. Um, pros and cons, um, of course the pros is that it opens the solar market by 80% because as you know, solar traditionally has always been associated with rooftop. So now as young professionals or 
um, older adults who are trying to downsize can now, if you're in a high rise or an apartment dweller, access community solar. Um, so clean energy for all, low income. The problem is that people don't know that this legislation exists. Mm -hmm. um, and also some of the cons is that folks still associate community solar when you're trying to talk about it with the people knocking at your door or promising you all types of different rates and you know they get bamboozled and um, they just don't want to hear anything else about changing or doing anything for their utility bill. Um, so that's when the community comes in um, to go against the stigma because this is a rare opportunity for us to take advantage of the advocates and um, the lobbyists that make sure that the legislation passed and that this pilot program is successful. Um, and of course, all the amazing opportunities, whether it's partnering with different um, similar mission organizations or the jobs when the farms are created, creates green jobs right in our neighborhood um, and subscription organizations. Like when I was graduating from Howard, we didn't have this. I couldn't major in this in community solar. The job wasn't even available. Like the job just came available. So it's creating jobs 10, 15 years out from now. And as you can see, um, in the last year, community solar doubled um, by 50% as far as the entire fastest pace in the solar market itself. So um, we, Minnesota is pretty much leading the race <laughs> um, in Massachusetts and then pretty much the other states is like the making up the small, but we're only 2% of all solar, um, all solar capacity, which is still a small percentage <laughs> of the solar market as a whole. Um, and yeah, I can, ask, I can answer specific questions um, regarding community solar. But the biggest thing is for people to understand, well, how does it work? Like, how can, I, how can I actually get solar and it's not on my roof? And it's just like, well, it's a hoax. No, it's not a hoax. Like, <laughs> you can actually walk past our solar farms. And the biggest thing is people just don't understand how they can have it um, without physical land wires being run to their home. And so that's when it really takes um, extra advocacy and physical bodies and leaders, community leaders actually out there so people know like, no, we're not the people on your door. And no, this is not a hoax. It's not just in theory. Um, these solar farms are visible. They are being built. You can walk by them because they're tangible and they're physical. And um, we're all just fighting the same cause um, against climate change. And this is just one solution that includes everyone if you don't have $15,000 to drop on a huge solar um, system, you can join a solar farm for free. And right now, specifically, um, let's say you live in Maryland, we have some in Potomac Edison Utility, we have some in Pepco Utility, we have some in bg &E Utility. Um, and if you didn't attend a seminar, you didn't know. It's like you can go online and whether it's my company or a competitive company, there's access to solar power um, for Maryland residents and um, University of Maryland is leading the charge um, by having this symposium for the community so you can learn about these different opportunities. And um, I can answer any specific community solar questions about maybe how you can get involved. We wanna make sure that the pilot program is extended and continues, not just the funds that we create, but this can just be a model um, for our state, but also for countries and other countries. Because I run into different ambassadors and other people from different countries. It's like, oh, wow, we would love to take this back home to our native land. Um, and you guys are really paving the way. So, um, yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of really quick remarks and look forward uh, more interested in your questions than, uh, than my remarks. But um, so uh, what I would add is that uh, the financial analysts suggest that uh, by 2024, one quarter of rooftop solar installations will be paired with battery storage. Um, so the, the, the energy storage uh, industry is growing like gangbusters right now. And um, uh, so it's not just the, the 
maybe you've heard of the Tesla power walls that you know are on sale and expensive for uh, homeowners to use to connect with their solar panels. Uh, but there's lots of other ways that battery storage can be used um, at, at larger scale to help solve some really important problems. The way that I think about it is that um, my iPhone that is sitting over there charging has, uh, I think it's a 64 gigabyte, I can't remember 64, 128, but the, co the onboard computer, the onboard ship's computer that landed men on the moon had like 12 kilobytes or something ridiculous. And, uh, the, you know, the, it's, so the technology has come so far and it's like we ought to be able to, to save energy and use it when we need it. And we can, actually can't do that right now at a large scale. Right now, when these lights are on, something when you flip on and off these lights, the system has to pull power from somewhere else. It's not being saved anywhere. Um, so this is a really big, it's a really big shift that we're about to witness in sort of how our electricity system runs. Um, think of it like um, what food, food delivery systems were like before we had refrigerators. That's what we're talking about in terms of, of, of energy storage. I'll think of it mostly in terms of batteries. I already made the slip once where I said battery storage instead of energy storage. There's lots of different technologies that can be used to store energy that are not just electrochemical, but are also mechanical and um, thermal, and all those are great too. But the, the point is that this is changing very rapidly. It's changing how we're thinking about um, sort of operating the electricity grid. Um, so what UCS has uh, tried to do is that we, we think a lot in the you know, I'm, I'm one of our spreadsheet guys, and, and we think a lot about how you, do, how you define the rules so that everybody can, uh, all the different technologies can sort of compete equally. Um, and what, we've been, what we thought about in the context of storage is we actually had two uh, separate um, uh, energy, small convenings, expert convenings. The first one was focused on research and development and brought together some wonky academics and researchers to talk about what the priorities were for research and how that translates to what the federal government ought to be spending money on. The second one we held in December is, is the one I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, before I sit down and listen to your questions. And, and that was just uh, really focused on the deployment question. So how do you get more of this stuff out there? What can states do to, to actually drive more of the installations happening? And uh, importantly, how can we set up those policies? The way that we framed it was, how do we set up those policies in such a way that we um, we get more energy storage out there, but we also do it in such a way that puts communities first. Um, and, the, and, and so, you know, there are lots of, you know, I'm in D.C., I, my office in D.C., and there are lots of little tables where we get all the policy walks together, we sit down and we think up the best ideas, or at least we think we do, and, and then we go off and we try to put those into practice. And, and uh, the way that we looked at this as an organization was, and our project team was, Maybe we ought to actually ask communities what they think about storage and how they see it and what questions do they have about it. I mean, just similar to what the earlier panels were saying, there's just a lot of confusion about what this thing even is and what does it mean and what do we do with it. And so uh, what we did in December is we brought together 33, that was about 30, 33 people uh, from a pretty diverse, um, both racially and, uh, but also from their expertise um, together to sort of talk about storage. So we had a, a big representation from uh, environmental justice and community uh, organizations, grassroots organizations. We had some uh, wonky technical experts uh, that focus on storage and policy. Uh, we had people from the industry that represent uh, solar installers and storage installers. Uh, we had labor folks there. We had consumer advocates that worry about uh, keeping, making sure that the, the, your bills are affordable and People don't have to pay too much. Um, we have faith groups and, and advocates for renewable energy and, um, and even a few state legislators in the room. So it was just really an interesting mix of people and we found that we had to spend a lot of time up front uh, sort of coming to, uh, uh, getting on the same page about what we're talking about because we found that you know, a lot of the community leaders maybe didn't know what storage was or what we meant by it. And a lot of the sort of wonkier people didn't even didn't understand what equity was or why should we ask community people about what they think. I mean, this, this is good for them, so why should they care about it? Well, it turns out they have really legitimate questions about, you know, what the technology means. And, and so what we did with that conversation was we really um, uh, started to, to have a dialogue with this. You know, it was, a, it was like I said, a limited group of people, but it was a pretty representative group. It was focused on three states, uh, Maryland, Minnesota, and Illinois, to try to 
to thinking of places where we felt like there might be some advancement or possibility of advancing legislation. Um, and so the first thing that we've been able to produce, which was just published this week, is on the end there are our um, principles for equitable deployment of energy storage. And that's what that group came together and sort of um, identified as the six principles that we want to keep in mind as we're thinking about how we design policies that um, deploy energy storage. So grab one of those. It's in English and Spanish. Um, I'm going to take a seat and answer whatever questions we have about it. But I want to give you a little flavor for what we do. Sure, absolutely. So there were a couple pieces. Uh, so the um, there are a lot of really interesting ways that storage can be used to help communities. For example, uh, a lot of frontline communities are, are dealing with either a coal power plant or a natural gas power plant or a peaking power plant that only gets turned on certain times of the year, and they suffer the air implicate, you know, the, the air pollution impacts of that. So. For example, um, if there is ways to use storage that displace the need for those power, those dirty power plants, there's a real, um, there's a real benefit to communities if it's done correctly. So that was one thing was the concept of being able to reduce emissions, not just to re greenhouse gas emissions, but criteria air pollutants. There's a there's a principle around resilience, so uh, helping uh, communities be able to um, deal with and recover from the loss of a, a, a power after a storm or a disaster. Uh, man-made or, or, or natural. Um, thinking me through, we mentioned the jobs piece, and so there was some discussion about economic development, and what does that mean in the context of storage, uh, accelerating greater levels of renewable energy, so um, you know, getting out, getting out of this long-standing talking point that the sun doesn't always shine in the window, it doesn't always glow, which drives me crazy. Um, the more storage that we have, you know, the more that we can take the renewable resources from when we have them to when, when we need them. Um, and then uh, making sure that consumers are protected so that you know, we're just not doing the most expensive project and charging ratepayers, that we're, we're trying to make sure that this is actually a benefit to people who are paying their electricity bills, which it can be. And then finally, ensuring that there's participation, that when the project is built, um, that that developers have to actually talk to people in communities to think of, to, to you know answer their questions and address their concerns. So that's a little bit of flavor for it. I can pass it around. Thanks. So I'm just going to take a liberty and ask a couple of questions before we open it up to the room. Um, each of you talked about a technology that is not too foreign. And, and it's potentially something we've been using in one form or another for a really long time. Can you talk to the audience about why, why this is a good moment for community solar, why this is a good moment for energy storage? And then following that, I'd like to talk about what are the pitfalls, what could go wrong, and how could this good thing be used against communities? Because that's a really important insight for folks who are thinking about it a lot. So we'll start with the positive question first. Who wants to take that first? Um, I would say, of course, the positive. While we are like in the federal government, we have the Green New Deal, so there's a lot of momentum um, around renewable energy and solar. Um, so as you know, if you're playing basketball and you have the game, if you're winning, you want to keep that momentum going. So why stop when everyone's talking about it and we can build on it? The legislation is passed. We have projects available. Um, so this is the this is the moment right now. Like it's the answer to the question. It's like, well, why not now? Because we're in the moment. Um, you don't stop momentum. Um, and yeah, that's that's to my first question. Yeah, just yeah. I think community solar is great right now because we're seeing the cost of solar drop. So it's becoming more and more cost competitive, which will allow more and more people to participate and actually save money on their electricity bills going forward. Um, so yeah, I think the, the competition or the like the winning to get winning for the solar industry, but also competition like pitting states against each other. Like it, we want Maryland to stay in a leadership role, so we want we really want to build out um, community solar. And I also think Maryland was one of the first states that really took the challenge of figuring out how to get low and moderate income projects, like making that a core part of the regulatory regime for it. So I think that's another like. We want Maryland to be the model, so they need to. So Maryland needs to keep improving, and then more states need to keep competing. Sure. Well, I would just go back to what I was saying earlier about the, you know, the, the moment that we're in in terms of this technology taking off. 
Um, it's been said that this that the storage industry is basically where solar was 10 years ago. So it's just starting to become economic to where the projects are starting to make sense and, and pencil out economically. And, and so, um, you know, the way that I think about it is like, let's let's figure out how to prioritize and actually improve the communities instead of just doing the most economic projects or doing the one that makes the utility the most money. Let's think about how to prioritize the, the, the urgency of something we need. So storage, to give you a, a little bit of note, it's gonna be probably a $4 billion industry by the early like 2023, which is about 15, 17 times bigger than what it is right now. So there's just, there's a big change. There were sort of why? like the, could you, could a you different say why? curve, but it's, it's because of that economics. The technology has become mature enough that we kind of know how to deal with it, and it's, it's just where we have to evolve. What could go horribly wrong? Maybe I'll just keep talking as I'm saying. I would say two things. <laughs> yeah. and, then two things. Yes. and then we don't have to switch back and forth. So fires, <laughs> for, for lithium ion batteries, fires is a big concern of, of folks. Uh, and one did just get burned down uh, in Arizona last week. So they're, so they're making sure that we have the standard, the safety standards correct, um, and that we're on board with that is really important. Um, there's a lot of questions that we found in our convening about um, people wanting to know what happens to the batteries after the project. Who's going to recycle them? Are you just going to leave them here? Like, mm -hmm. that's sort of what happens with other that's plants, right. whether it's nuclear uh, waste or whether it's coal ash pond, it just sort of ends up staying there. Um, I would say it's not quite the same level of toxicity as a, as a nuclear waste uh, uh, or, or a coal ash pond, but it's still a legitimate question. And what happens? Like, what are you going to do when you're done with the, the batteries? Are some of them taken to the recycling? Um, I would say what can go wrong is when you look at community solar, um, it's a two-pronged approach. You have the developers who are the first um, on, the, on the ground that's actually building it. So when you think about development and community solar projects, um, there was a case, I think, with GW or I don't know, this university, so scratch that, where they were looking at um, for a station. So you don't want to... Um, fight climate change by going solar, but then you're cutting down trees to build solar farms. So there was a lot of um, backlash against a huge or uh, against one of the universities that was looking to build a megawatt um, facility and take down forestation. Um, now on the subscribers end, as far as the front facing community and signing up, it's a pilot program. So the kinks, you know, when there's new technology, it's kind of buggy. Um, so you know, maybe uh, some of the residents don't understand their bill, there's calling, or maybe the system goes down, and they're like, well, what if these solar credits, or some solar credits then roll over? Um, as more volume kicks up, it's just like implementing and making sure that um, the, the, the credits and the customer service, and we can handle um, this change and everyone building is correct. So I would, I would say it's a two-prong. Um, your point as far as what can go wrong as far as the development side, um, as well as the customer subscriber side. Yeah, I think there are still some challenges on financing too. Like I think it's great that the policy has been enabled now, and we knew some of the problems that we were hoping to address by working on this policy. Um, however, some of not everyone is able to access. Like we kind of we talked about this as a way that everyone will be able to access solar energy. That it hasn't gotten there yet. I'm optimistic that with more time it will, but I just I want to be careful that we're not like over promising and under delivering. Um, so I think that's the onus is on the people who've been working on it to figure out like what are those remaining barriers and what can we do to remove them. I think there are lots of issues with how programs are with how projects are financed, how you like bring your subscribers in. Um, there are a couple things that are I, I think Nathan and Son is doing a lot of work on this where you have to like check. Like, because you're subscribing to something and there's a credit check. Well, not everyone has a credit score because not everyone has, has access to credit. So that's a barrier that, um, just because you don't have a credit score, that doesn't mean you don't pay your electricity bill. So I think those kind of false connections of using, like, other proxies that aren't very accurate. Um, so I think that there, we know what some of these barriers are, and we just need to keep working on removing them. So it truly is an equitable energy source. One of the most exciting things I've heard as the, we were hoping for this renewal to happen was the idea that, yeah, you can't, if you can't get credit and you don't have the upfront cash, you can't do it. 
we started to brainstorm, well, if you are in your community, you are making these payments, you might also be paying into other institutions. How have other states looked at handling, um, what is the amount you have to pay? It's like, um, uh, the subscription yeah, thing, if you yeah. do, if you if you start one of these plans through some other methodology, and you pull out of the plan because you can't afford it or you need to move, you can be you know, be assessed a fifteen hundred dollar penalty, and and because of that, uh, that and the length of the contracts, people would say, I don't have the ability or interest in signing a twenty five year contract for something yeah. right. because. I have other plans, or I don't know what my plans are in yeah. 25 years. That's a long time. And so um, one of the answers that happen in the in-between are three-year contracts and five-year contracts. One-year contracts? What, yeah, Here's just to end. And, but that month came, to month now, it's grown. Even like in the next um, two years, it went from us not being able to move one subscriber because the developers want their money back. So they're like, we need 25-year contracts. And we're like, listen, I'm in the community. We can't move these. And so now it's gotten to where we have month to month options yeah, cool. um, for LMI up to 25% for low to moderate household, which is historic. Um, so, yeah, we've come a long way just in, you know, 12 months. But that came from feedback from communities and that right. came from having folks who are doing this work in the thinking realm coming out in the communities and saying, why isn't this working? It's such a it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Why is nobody picking up a to piece of toast? You know, so, <laughs> so it's a really important question. And people are like, well, I just don't want to commit, to make that kind of commitment because I haven't made that kind of commitment to anything except this <laughs> property if I own it or potentially not if I'm renting. The other piece was this $1,500. I'm supposed to have $1,500 ready at, at people. There have been enough studies recently about how in cumulative wealth, most folks cannot come up with $500 without making a lot of things happen in short notice. So being expected to sign something that automatically makes you culpable for $1,500, even if you have it, sounds like pressure to people who have other expenses. So the response around that in other states has been, where else are you paying money? Well, other institutions have a relationship with you. In some of those cases, churches have come together and said, well, since we're an anchor in this community and we've been here for 20 years or 40 years or 50 years, we're gonna guarantee the number of people that are in our church because they're there. And so what does it mean to say you have a relationship with an institution and what that and what their relationship is to you just as a guarantor saying, I, we will be responsible for the $1,500 for everyone that's here because we collect that much week over week if we're in a massive church and there's so many churches. So it is. there are many creative solutions. That's happened in mosques. It's happened in uh, Christian non-denominational churches. So it is... Yes, it's happened in synagogues. So if you are a part of a community, community solar can have a lot of meanings and it's only limited by your ability to imagine who's in the community. Um, there was a question that popped up here. So I will pause with my questions. Just to I just was wondering, when you're them. talking about those uh, contracts, is that with the people who are going to be providing the solar, like you were mentioning solar farms, or is that the individual who would be in an apartment unit? I wasn't sure what the contract who would put. Right, so the contract is between the subscriber organization and the resident. So let's say anyone in this room who's interested in signing up, you would be, um, you will have to sign a contract for your subscription. And the subscription is pretty much based off of your individual utility usage. So that's why you need a contract. Any other questions? Yeah, um, given the fact that we see the wealth divide widely, in this country. And we see that, and you know, you mentioned churches. We know that most urban churches right now, their congregation members are coming from the urban communities where they're located. Right. Because yeah, of gentrification. Outside. They've been moving So to the, the institutional framework in many of these low to moderate in income neighborhoods are very low in terms of their capacity. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about being equitable in terms of just this opportunity for, particularly for renters. Because we know most of the low income uh, persons living in cities are renters, they have homeowners. How do we get them on board? Is there some 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 tax incentive that the government will provide to them as a then pathway to participate? Or do, does the, the system sort of continue to grow and they economically become shut out in, in terms of accessing it? And given the fact that most of the, the developers who are doing uh, redevelopment in many cities are doing um, rentals, mm -hmm. uh, not home ownership. Again, it doesn't create the pathway for those those renters to really access uh, the benefits of saving on the energy costs and using that cost maybe to 
as a savings long term for other uh, income needs. Uh, so uh, I, my question is really all around, are there any innovative uh, uh, programs that are coming up to provide some tax incentive for states or, or localities to supplement this cost for those who, who, who have the inability to pay? I'll let the panelists answer before I do. So. Okay. Um, I'd say the tax incentives are there for developers to um, offer the low to moderate income contract, whereas the discount is um, larger. So up front, that's money in the people that really need it. So 25% off your entire bill, that's huge. Where else are you getting 25% guaranteed for as long as those panels is generating power on your behalf? In addition to that, working with local community association groups um, advocating at different programs or small businesses and partnering with them and offering them um, a fundraiser whoever they can get on board then you know you can get a kickback just by signing up people for free to the state pilot program so of course the developers are getting a, a larger tax incentive for including the low to moderate income so that that is i guess an interest for them to have that component of part of their farm. Um, and for the communities, they have a larger discount than just say the open or general category where it's typically five or 10% and low and moderate household incomes get 25%, 20%. And that's on par with traditional solar systems. Um, so that's the incentives right there. The problem is people just don't know that they exist. So, you know, with me or my company or others in this room that knows about it, it's our duty you now have a duty um, now that you know that these programs, they're already available. Um, it's just word of mouth and um, helping spread the word. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And in addition to the great work that Neighborhood Sun is doing, like, like spending time with communities, I think that there are more policy options that we can be accessing. And that's something where a lot of really smart people are thinking about it. Um, we have some wonderful legislators in Maryland who have really taken this challenge on. Um, and I, I don't know what all those solutions are, but we've heard, um, like I know that there are like green banks are starting to pop up in states, so that's a way that there's a set, um, like a, an, a financial entity that's backing the project, so it gets rid of some of those upfront like credit check requirements, and that way, um, if there, if someone had, like if a bill is a little bit higher, like there's an entity that can come in and like take care of that. Um, like one anecdote that I love to share is we've worked some with a, an organization that does electricity bill assistance and they're still working on it, but they're hoping that they've estimated that taking 10 years of uh, the money that they like provide to their customers for bill assistance could actually provide 20 years of community solar subscription. So I think there are like creative um, models like that. It's just figuring out how to like get the upfront capital to make them work. So. And then that's where we need to get some more of our friends who work on finance issues to like jump in and be willing to take a little bit more. Um, I don't even think it's more risk, but being willing to like to use their like their risk calculations differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I see because um, I work with a lot of developers, for profit and nonprofit, I'm not seeing them use uh, um, in solar as a part of their development envelope. Even when you go through District of Columbia, you see all the new development that's being done around condos. Yeah. You look on the rooftops, you don't see no solar panels. Mm -hmm. Just ask, it's, what's the development envelope? Well, you know, in terms, of, as, in terms of, as, as they develop their their uh, uh, model in terms of, uh, of the unit, um, that's something they don't incorporate as a line item, solar. So when you go through the District of Columbia, you don't see solar panels on the roofs of many of these, these mm -hmm. condominium developments. And then and the, on the nonprofit side, many of them are not uh, even have not been introduced as a measure to incorporate it in their home ownership model for their homeowners coming in. So again, there seems to be a lot of, of education that has to go on in terms of getting these, these developers involved and getting them educated in terms of the benefits that they can have that can pass on to their either their, their renters or their purchases. These are things that I've never thought about, so I would love to talk to you afterwards about what can we do to help ensure that the communication gets out to a broader? Yeah. Jeremy, do you have any comments that you want to make about this? Because I do think I want to make sure energy storage doesn't get off the hook yeah. in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> because because uh, the sun does keep shining and the wind keeps blowing, but thanks to climate change, the wind is blowing more. 
So there's a whole other conversation we can have about offshore wind, onshore wind, uh, parking lot solar, um, brownfield solar, which mm -hmm. has had a project and has had projects in Washington D.C. forever. That entire program, brownfields, is completely voluntary, mm -hmm. which means you can re you can revitalize land that would otherwise poison people and put a solar farm on it right next to a community mm -hmm. that has otherwise just been suffering. And the fact that in order to get into that program, you have to be certified by a bank. Not an entity that thinks about the environment or anything else. You have to be certified as viable, and that that pro and that any restrictions on how you might get into it are strictly voluntary. But it's a voluntary program, so you don't have to jump through a lot of hoops. We should have significant amounts of of solar in Washington D.C. just because this program has been around forever. Well, you, have a, you have me think about Detroit, all that vacant housing that's, that's right. going over the demolition, yes. even in Baltimore City. Creating yes. opportunities for yeah, and and that's land that would otherwise be unusable. Unusable. Mm -hmm. So I saw some hands up. I just I have a question. I'm sorry if this, if this is an obvious answer. I just we're in a school. I'm pretty sure you can ask any. <laughs> I don't have a background <laughs> answer. So, um, with storage, my question is: my understanding, which could be wrong, is that with storage, people who either have solar or are participating in community solar, that energy doesn't, ex excess energy doesn't go back onto the grid. And so then people who don't have access to solar or community solar, but are still on the grid, are paying more for their electricity bills. Is it A, is that true? And B, how, how do you deal with that? So there's a lot to unpack there. And it's, it's it something it. that's. We're still in school. <laughs> it's not a dumb question at all. Um, so um, let me talk for a second and just interrupt me if I'm not getting to your question. So when you typically, typically when you put a solar panel on your roof, your homeowner or your building, um, when it's just connected directly to the grid. And so if you're in a state where um, you have the right to sell back the power to the utility at the same rate they sell to you, which is called net meter. That's great because that means that you're if you're generating more energy than you're using in that building, then you get paid in the amount that you for your state homes. Okay. Um, the thing is though that when the grid goes down, your solar panels go away. Like you, that's a common misconception that you think, oh, I've got solar panels on the roof and it's a bright sunny day and I can keep generating power, but it's not true because it's it's dependent on that signal from the grid. That's sort of how it works. Storage takes that away. So then, if you have a, if if you have to, if you put a battery at your house connected to the solar panels, then you can charge your batteries and use them if the, if the grid goes down. So that's that's sort of the first thing in terms of the, uh, you know, the electrical connections. Um, the the thing to know about that's a talking point that's been used is like, okay, well we're we're subsidizing. Um, you know, we have people that can't afford solar that are paying more, so the people that have solar can can do that. And and I think there's a lot there's a lot more to talk about in that context. So um, typically, when a utility makes that argument, it's because they're worried about solar panels cutting into their profits. I mean, straight up, like if, if you're generating more of your own power, you're not paying them for the power, and so they they see a lot of that as a threat and use some of those arguments to try to generate. You know, backlash against it or raise fees. So a lot of times you'll see a lot of states where they they try to raise the upfront fees of putting the solar panels on. the The reality is there's been some studies that have looked at this and have found that if you capture all of the value that rooftop solar provides, it actually does benefit everyone. I, I'd have to dig up the study to find it, but um, but but if you actually capture all the different value that solar panels provide, it, it does benefit. And I'll just add that um, this is a this is a non-traditional conference, so I can say this confidently that that's disorganizing behavior. Like making something more expensive so less people try it is a tactic yeah. to make a thing that could be good, could be invested in, and is viable unappealing to people. So we just have to think, put our critical thinking hats on around some of the disincentives that come up to take away the benefits. Also, this technology is not new. Jimmy Carter put it on the White House. A lot of things happen in the political <laughs> sphere to take us back to this moment. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I so yeah. So I just want to point out that like this is like the second time we've been at this. We actually pioneered this technology, which is like a sketchy word to begin with, but I'm gonna use it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, this technology was American, and by virtue of a lot of political fights, we never got here. And that talk, this technology now comes to us from other places. So we really just have to be thoughtful. It's also true in the context of electric vehicles. Like we have been here before. So some of the work that has to be done is happening because really smart people are thinking about vehicles, but some of this is about paying attention to what's happening in the space and you taking on responsibility in your relationship to regulators and folks who handle this stuff. Maryland has the Maryland Energy Administration. I mentioned it in an earlier panel. On average, the regional greenhouse gas uh, auction brings in 55 to $75 million annually. That money has to be spent on renewable energy projects in the state of Maryland by consumers. The only people who use it regularly are the same people who've been using it since we had the auction. Mm -hmm. We call, we used to call, I used to work there, and we used to call it the Frequent Flyer Program. And it's really nice to see the same person putting on a solar deck, then a solar kitchen, then a solar school. But, we, but it would've been really great to see some folks who never came into the space getting access to their same, the money that they have exactly as much right to. And so some of that is about us inspecting our own relationship and paying attention to what's happening in our billing, what's happening in these conversations with regulators, and what our state agencies are doing. Not every state has an energy administration. So we have the sudden culpability. I think I saw some questions over this way. Yeah. Um, so Jessica, you mentioned that um, one of the best ways to like, um, encourage people to participate in the Supreme Court is through policy. So like, I'm from West Virginia, so um, it's kind of hard to advocate for policy change. So um, do you have any suggestions of how to really, really advocate for it? I do. So uh, <laughs> thank you for being here today. Um, I think West Virginia, is, it's a really fascinating place. And it's a place I've actually been spending a lot of time thinking about how, like, what are the policies that work? And um, I'll just, this is a little bit of like how I work in, as a lobbyist. I think about issues and like members of Congress and men members of state legislators on like a, I think in my head as a ladder of engagement. So like the wrong one is like someone, like a legislator, like you go and meet with them. Like rung two, um, maybe they call you and they have a question about something. Rung three, they like send a letter to someone. Like rung four, they're like working on legislation. So sometimes those rungs can take a ton of work in between. But I think energy is one where it's really critical to get legislators thinking about like use like what you know about them like what is a policy that will resonate with them so like energy efficiency i think is a great kind of like entry level energy issue so it's the no one likes to use more energy than we need to like no one wants to say like oh i'm just gonna like turn the lights on and let them run when i'm on vacation for a week because it's fun to pay more for electricity like, that's just i don't i think that's an issue that you can talk across the aisle to so what i would suggest is like spend some time thinking about like what are those like gateway issues that you can work on and then as they see like oh this isn't as scary and complicated as I thought like look for more ways and opportunities to engage them and um, I think community solar is a great one too especially talking across the aisle because you're opening access you're allowing more people to access markets like those are talking points that should resonate with most people um well yeah so I think that's <laughs> it's all about like kind of thinking about like where those folks are coming from and I mean, this is this can be long term. Like, I don't think we're gonna wake up in the West Virginia General Assembly and like make any like big energy decisions right away. But you have to start somewhere, and if we don't start somewhere with them now, then um, we don't get anywhere. And I'll just add because I am from West Virginia and it's near near my heart. And I, I, the comment about energy efficiency is really quite well uh, because it's um, you know the the cheapest energy is the uh, energy. Right, and so the so the point is like that. There is um, a lot of parts of Central Appalachia that have a really poor housing stock. And if we could think through like how to get resources to that region to help people, you know, improve their. Because it doesn't make solar. It doesn't make uh, sense to put solar panels on a house that's that has no insulation. It just means that that's not the thing you do first. The thing you do first is to make sure that the house is insulated. There are places in in Central Appalachia where uh, a family might be paying um, two hundred dollars a month for their mortgage and eight hundred dollars a month. For their I mean, it's that bad. And so there's a there's a great model for this called the Pay as You Save program. Um, that you can Google and it's it's fantastic. And it's a way that the utility um, 
can access capital to actually make the investments at your home, and then they charge you a bill, a, an amount on your bill for that investment um, that's less than what you're the that you're saving. So the, so you're still saving a big chunk of money, and then there's this extra charge um, that help makes helps to make those payments. Um, and what it what it mean what it needs is a group of people to go around and actually assess the buildings and then make the improvements. And guess what? Those are jobs. So, I have a lot more to say than we've been talking about. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> about <what's right. laughs> you mentioned a little bit about... Um, Use your outside voice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just got over a cold. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about the low income. Um, can you clarify or maybe shed a little bit of more light and about the low income like versus like subsidized housing how is there is there an opportunity there for solar um community solar and considering that subsidized housing usually be paid um that your rent and usually it's all inclusive in some cases i'm not sure if in all cases i come from massachusetts um <laughs> excuse me so um would that mean that savings in an energy bill would still would just save the um the state or the city money and not necessarily the individual. I don't know if you're catching what I'm trying yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. I will. I, I think, I'll give you guys a chance to think about it because I want to say that one thing that just happened in New York is sort of jump is a leapfrog over all of this. Bill De Blasio just passed a bill saying that all every single building in New York City has to have solar on it. That that's because most of the most of the emissions that are being calculated in that specific environment are coming from the building sector. So to pass legislation that says that by X date all of these buildings have to be have solar, some of that will be through various kinds of programs, but the mandate is there, which means there's a whole bunch of market responses. The community solar can fill some of that gap. Um, people who are able to afford it can take advantage of incentives to get it and be the owners of the, how they make the power. But that, but just having a framework that says, here is our goal because it solves some of our problems. Whereas in Maryland, we have issues that are much more around the transporta around transportation and being able to realize that same kind of bang for your buck. So uh, just as a framing conversation around ways that we are responding to that in the context of subsidized housing, that includes, like, that would include all of the housing and whoever is the landlord and whoever is the owner would receive the benefit of one participating in the program and the person who owns the space would participate in the benefit of having the price, to have the price of electricity go down over, over time until it's negligent. The other thing I want to say as a reminder is that as we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, when the earth got carved up between folks who were going to run electricity, they paid for infrastructure then. They are making money hand over fist. For, for anything other than maintenance. And that usually involves picking up leaves so you, you don't cause a fire that destroys a lot of people's lives. So I just want to point out that like we're, we're, when we're talking about who pays the cost and where they are, there are a lot of things to consider and I'll make space for the panelists to answer your question because it's a good one around subsidized housing and whether or not the benefit is enough as opposed to ownership value. Right, um, there is a difference between like subsidized housing if it includes your utility, um, that would exclude community solar because community solar is only open space to folks who have a utility bill. Um, and the difference between low and moderate household income subscribers and just open category subscribers is that the discounts are vast. So on again, the average savings for a middle class family, upper middle class family, open category would be 10% off their bill. Whereas LMI is 25%. Um, so that right there is um, accessible for low to moderate income communities that have those projects available. So in the city of Baltimore, um, I'm in Park Heights, you know, I'm on the west side and the east side, um, and they can tap into these projects and receive that money, keep that money in their pockets each month, and we remove the credit check, we remove the long-term contract. So now it's accessible, they're not afraid of joining a 20-year pilot program. Um, they don't have to worry about a cancellation fee. They don't have to worry about a hard credit check um, or a hit on their credit when they're building their credit. Um, so that makes it more accessible um, for these underserved communities. Um, and I know on the legislative side, um, it's a mandate. Um, and I think Jessica can talk more about that. Yeah, and I, 
There's a percentage of the project that have to be elementary, but on the subsidized housing point too, um, I would say like don't say it if you don't know everything about it. But I, I know that they were during I'll the Obama. On the record button. <laughs> um, I believe that during the Obama administration, there were programs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development that would have increased solar siting in subsidized housing. Yep. I'm not okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think there. Community still answers some of that, like that if you pay your electricity bill, that's an answer. But I think you raise a really great point that that doesn't help, that doesn't like help everyone. Like that doesn't let everyone pay an electricity bill. But there, so we should think about other solutions to other folks on board. Is storage fund related to impacts for subsidized housing or low to moderate income housing? No, I don't think I have a lot to add on the storage piece. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I would just back up a step, so because I don't. I don't know a lot about how some of the, like how these projects work at some of that's housing, but what I would say is that um, when a developer decides to build a project, they have to be able to monetize the tax credit. So the, at least right now, all the tax credits are still in effect. So um, that means that somebody has to be able to own the panels and then claim the tax, you know, claim that benefit on their taxes, and that's how they make the project as well. So it would seem to me that there'd be a way that. You know, a utility can you know build this project and then monetize that and pass the benefits of this energy savings scheme. So the thing is that the the what happens in some states like West Virginia. Back to your question about West Virginia is one of the states that does not allow public uh, uh, power purchase agreements, so PPAs. That means that a third party can own the solar panels and, and actually monetize that tax credit and make it work for both the homeowner and then for their the bottom line, right? And so that's been a real hindrance. That's why you've seen uh, this this uh, growth in the solar industry over the last decade is that power you know third parties companies like Solar City and others were able to come in and say, look, we can work the financing out for you. We can put the solar panels on your roof. Uh, we'll own them, but we'll let you buy the power from us, and we'll, we'll cancel it out and it's work. Sorry. Can you speak up? I said sorry. I said you have these um, parking garages. The like power all purchase are, agreement. They're all powers. Okay. Is everybody clear with that vehicle power purchase agreements? So the other thing is about the pay as you save program that I mentioned earlier is that, and I know we're not talking about energy efficiency, but it's such an important piece of the puzzle when you're talking about low and moderate income families mm -hmm. there's a, a big there's just such a big opportunity to improve the housing stock and that pay as you say program that I mentioned before they're getting around that barrier of like oh I'm the renter I don't own this property how do I do it well or I'm you know I'm in public housing how do we do this like there, there's there's ways that you can get through the the financing hoops if you know if you have the right actors involved that want to do so and our subject is energy equity. So actually everything that fits in that space and creates room. Maryland has had similar weatherization programs where they go in under that umbrella, but it came from folks at the Maryland Energy Administration saying we have this budget and then we go to the house and there's a hole in the floor that goes all the way to the ground. Or there are pipes that are leaking out everything, including heat and water and energy. Can we just wrap those in something? And it came from inspectors going in and saying I cannot do my job in a way that makes sense if you don't let me deal with this other thing first and a lot of agencies trying to figure out how they could talk to each other so I do think efficiency as like as the ground level thing that has to happen but also has the benefit of solving people's everyday problems because if you have a hole in your floor or air a heat is leaking out or you can't cool your home you're having problems. I think that that is like a, sort of a baseline strategy as you're starting to build up to a future where, I mean, the, in the Maryland General Assembly last year, we talked about what it would look like to plan 12 years ahead for underserved communities in Maryland. And what, how can you get to a smart home if your, home, if your dumb home isn't working for you? Right. Like, how do, like how, do we, how do we get to a house where you can watch everything happening on the ring and program all the stuff on Nest? If, if there are so many leaks coming in out of it that you can't keep water and air in your house in the proportion that you want. So, so I do think we have to address those questions because those are folks who are already to some extent wealthy because as you pointed out in the rural space, there are people who might be living on their own land 
but their own land, like what that means is not is a quality of life question. If you're unincorporated, you could have issues, you could be connected to well water, and then that has other problems. So I do think all of this is happening in context, but energy is the thing that connects everybody, literally. So we have to be bringing equity into the conversation. Question. Um, yeah, so kind of following on that, I was wondering if you guys have seen any policies or programs that have had co-benefits. Um, you mentioned health um, in terms of having a healthy home. Um, I just heard of projects that use renewable energy to power wastewater treatment plants. That's improving water quality. Have there been co-benefits for things like creating you know, community banks to prevent gentrification? Um, I guess just addressing other issues. So what are the intersections between creating these types of um, yeah, energy programs? And, well, one weird co-benefit is if you have community solar, you can be a charger for bikes and um, scooters. <laughs> like that's, that, And I actually learned that from a random person who was on a street saying that that's what they do. Like, I have solar panels on my house, so now I'm like the number one person who grabs all the scooters and charges them and Bird sends me a check. And I was like, holy crap! I didn't even, and the person said that that's what they're doing at their church. So then their church is a part of this other secondary economy that's going around collecting everyone's like dead bikes. So, so, so like that is not a community level solution, no, but, like, but it's the creativity of community that came up with, yeah. with like being able to be an aggregator of another kind of benefit that their community may or may not be participating in yeah. because they made this initial investment. Thoughts from the panel? Um, another random similar um, anecdote <laughs> is like beekeepers that came to us like, hey, can you add pollinators to your farm? So now like the bees um, can be taken care of just by coming to our little solar farm and um, they're not being harmed and we're not putting pesticides and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was just like one little benefit or <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot in terms of uh, co-pollutants. Mm -hmm. So I think you were talking a little bit more water than just air pollution. But, yeah, I mean, but yeah, that, that's, that's sort of, um, we did a report last year called uh, Soot to Solar that looked at how you, like, uh, it was a case study of some coal plants in Illinois that, um, you know, what would happen, could you replace them with solar storage? Like, what would that look like? How much power do you really need? Because you always hear this, well, you know, if we take away all these coal plants, you know, the, the grid's going to go down, we're not going to have power prices go up. And what we found for one in particular, um, was just uh, north of Chicago, was that you didn't actually need the 600 megawatts. You really needed like 100 megawatts to make sure that the, you know, the, because it is a high load area just outside of Chicago. Um, but you could do that with solar panels and some storage. And what that what that means is that then you can repurpose the land of that site. You don't need to have you can have redevelopment of the area. It has to be done under the sense of local concerns, as we've really to. Um, you know, and, and it reduces that air pollution. So yeah. it's like for, for coal plants in particular, mm -hmm. uh, for peaking power plants uh, in particular, being able to offset those emissions is just such a huge, huge thing. I, I don't live in a frontline community myself, I would say, but a few years ago, we had a substation blow up underground near our office. And I remember you know, knowing this because the diesel generator on our building was fired up for like two days. And it was horrible walking in and out of the building, and, and that's the kind of air pollution impact that you have. You have to fire up these these really dirty plants to, to make sure that we need to work. And just one other like kind of overlapping issue to note: um, a bill passed in the General Assembly that's also being signed on Monday that will provide grant programs to school systems to transition their school bus fleets to electric vehicles. So that's another one that's. Like, huge air quality benefits and then I also think as we're building out more electrification infrastructure that will hopefully help with some of these issues of grid life. well I don't want to even say the truck administration's term for that um, that I think that will help address some of the issues of electricity he doesn't own words <laughs> I know. If anybody owns words it's not him I know <laughs> well like just like dealing with the grid we still want to be having more like as we do have more renewable energy coming onto the grid having more of these like, distributed um, yeah, um, really for uh, Jeremy, uh, with net metering, uh, does an uh, individual homeowner uh, benefit by having battery in his house? 
Can you explain what net metering is? Yeah. Uh, well, it means that the um, the grid will buy back uh, any excess energy that you generate for the same <coughs> retail price that you're buying um, electricity mm -hmm. from. Yeah, so you're asking uh, that. So net metering is great if you just have a solar panel because when you're not using the power, it goes back on the grid and you get paid for that. So you're asking, you slap a battery on your house, does that cut, cut away at that? Um, I guess it would depend on the size of your home and your energy usage, right? Because, um, you know, if you're, once you've charged your battery, presumably there's not any more excess that you, that you generate, you have to put that back on the grid. Yeah. My question is really, uh, is there any benefit to spending money on a battery? Uh, you have like an infinite battery, which is the grid. And uh, if, if you have perfect net metering, uh, it doesn't wear out, it doesn't cost anything uh, up front. Yeah, and there's a, there are, I think it, I think it probably, probably in certain locations where you, you have a lot of power outages, it might make sense for a certain home. Um, right. Uh, you know, I remember there was a set of severe storm storms that came through here, but it actually swept across a few states with the right show from a few years ago. There were places in West Virginia that were without power for two weeks after that storm because they were very remote places and they couldn't get the lines back on. So, I mean, it's a fair point. Like, there is a lot of there is a lot of concern about if too many people go where you know defect from the grid, just disconnect themselves from the grid. Then how do you provide services to everybody that's left. Uh, so I, I guess I haven't done my I'm not to net metering. Yeah. Just, you know, it's just a thought. No, it is, it's, a, it's a good thought. Uh, the people are thinking about that. And it is a similar, like if we were to step way out of this conversation and talk about the argument for um, charter schools, there are similar arguments being advanced about what does it mean for the original asset for a new alternative to pop up. Yeah. We haven't really done a good job of answering that question in any space. And we need to think about well, how are we grounding people in basic services that are necessities so that regardless of where they fit in the spectrum, they don't get less, yeah. right? They don't get less of what we all need in order to get through their lives. Because we can predict that people will need water and people will need land and people will need healthcare and people will need electricity. So especially if the hovercrafts ever show up that I was promised during Back to the Future, <laughs> um, I feel like we're probably going to, that's, there's probably a battery storage situation happening there. I just haven't figured it out yet. So, so I do think we have to continue to grapple with these, convert, with these questions as we think about finding equity now. Before, and, what, and, and what, go ahead, Jeremy. I didn't realize. No, no, uh, go ahead. I just was going to underscore what you're saying by saying that's why it's so important that we talk to communities about Okay, we thought of this great idea. What do you think? <laughs> right. Oh, actually, you didn't think of this other thing here that's actually yeah. really critical. Yeah, and, like, and thinking of it as a design process. Mm -hmm. Like, I think if we went, if we had these big ideas, part of the what was really great about the convening that UCS com had in Chicago was that it was a part of a design process. And it was an open-handed saying, we have these really great ideas, but we don't know if they're great unless people will actually be impacted by it. That told us whether it will happen in the way that we have imagined so I think there has to be some open-mindedness on behalf of the expert community mm -hmm. and expansion of who is an expert and what they bring to the conversation and where it is we're trying to go. Because having a great idea that doesn't go anywhere is equally useful as having a terrible idea that goes everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because the unintended impacts can be something that we all have to deal with in a multi-generational way. <laughs> so um, on that note, if there aren't any other questions, are there, oh, okay, well, okay. Well, can you speak? One and two. And then I think you guys will actually close us out. So I live on the Eastern Shore, Maryland, really rural area, and in my former role at the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, I was a community projects manager. So this is really encouraging to hear um, about community solar, since I was working in lower income communities like Cambridge frequently, and um, when I was bringing up renewables to cut down on energy costs, like, well, how would I even afford that? I don't, I'm not interested. I want to feed my family. So I'm, I'm interested. My first of a couple of questions is, um, how would you get that buy-in from the community whose priority is not necessarily how do you even approach this, but um, would it be maybe like a sponsor, like a city or a town or a county that would kind of just provide that community service to everyone um, so that they don't necessarily have to worry about it themselves. Um, I guess my second it might be more for Jeremy. Um, in my new role at the Nature Conservancy, I'm looking to do some coastal resiliency efforts. Do you see 
any overlap between the rural places of Maryland where they're getting inundated every day, especially in the lower shore, and how to use solar and storage to address some of the people's concerns who are having problems at a smaller local level. And uh, lastly, kind of to Tamara's point with the brownfields that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, I've actually had a conflict with my conservation work and large scale utility solar coming in and offering option contracts to my landowners who I've been working to get a conservation easement on the ground. And I'm wondering what all of your thoughts are on place. Um, so converting prime ag soils into solar or if it's a wetland using solar, is there any issues with maybe having a conflict with the conservation sector since I really want to encourage and work with solar? So how does that? I know that's a lot, sorry. <laughs> so while the panelists are thinking, I'll yeah. just say, I don't know if we would think about it as a design process that there's any conflict there. It sounds like a lack of open, like like all the stakeholders are not in the room. Right. If we're all trying to get to the same place and the first time we have a conversation is in a hearing where you're opposing a thing that in theory you respect and want to see happen because we didn't talk in the design phase, then our design process needs to be reconsidered. But you have some thoughts? Um, yeah, I can take your first question. Um, it, I think it's another two-prong um, solution based off of your community option. Um, one, if the community doesn't want to be burdened with the logistics of building their own solar farm, that they can look into joining a solar farm that already exists um, that has the LMI component attached to it. So right now, the Eastern Shore residents can now join. We have one project available in BGME, Del Marva. Um, as well as three farms um, coming online in the next four or five months. So your community can join those um, and also look at the legislation um, and partner with the groups that's under. If you go to, um, I know Soul United Neighbors have a whole breakdown of how you can build your own community solar projects. And if there were a, a brownfield or a landfill community center that would want to put it on their roof, that they can um, see about any funding and you know go about building their own project and then opening up that project to the residents themselves. So depending on where they are and the stage they are, there's different avenues that they can intersect um, community solar. Thank you. Um, I'll take a stab at your second few questions, which is uh, absolutely on the coastal resiliency piece. I think that's really insightful. Um, she meet my call, uh, colleague Astrid Kalbus, who's sitting here, done a tremendous amount of work. You already know her. <laughs> <laughs> so you're way ahead of me, so that's great. Um, so you know UCS has done a lot on coastal innovation. Well, with, yeah, with Astrid, it was more along the lines of like the policy planning for coastal communities um, for resiliency, but I, I didn't really understand that there was an intersection with such as solar. Yeah, so what we do, the, way, the thing that we were talking about in these principles was the idea that after Hurricane Sandy really just sort of underscored this, that there were so many communities that didn't have power after, for you know, weeks after the storm hit. Um, are there ways that we can install solar and storage uh, together in critical locations? So can we make sure that the hospital stays online and comes back online quickly? Can we, can we make sure the community center is repowered? Quickly, so that you know people have a, a place to, to gather and be sheltered. You know, so so thinking through what the critical pieces of infrastructure are, not not making sure that every house has power immediately after a storm, but but making sure that you know you have those that critical infrastructure power. That's where storage uh, paired with storage and power uh, paired with storage can be really useful. In terms of place, I was just I would just add that. There's a, there's a really interesting potential to use um, abandoned strip mine sites for solar panels. It hasn't quite, the economics hasn't really worked yet, um, and, but there are people thinking about it trying to figure out. It. And that's really exciting to me. I think the central and larger some of the sites that you know, are being used. Last question. Yeah, um, so I think as I'm listening to all the panelists, I see a lot of information knowledge and awareness that is lacking in the community. I think this room is full of very educated people and there is a lot that we don't know about solar. I was wondering for all of you or for any of you, are there any resources in terms of grants or funding for community-based organizations that we can use to leverage the opportunity to educate the community? 
I work for a local nonprofit that plant trees. We plant mm -hmm. native trees across Prince George's County. We've planted over 200 trees. And one of the contentions we get from people is, you are encouraging us to plant more trees, but we want to get solar. There is a there is there is there is intermix there between doing good by planting native trees, but also there is this other avenue for solar, and we get lost because we don't have any information. So, idea resources you can share also for organizations like us to yeah. to help. Um, I would say join your local um, climate act climate action group. Um, there's a lot of social media and different groups to see like what groups are doing what. <laughs> uh, what county are you in? PG County. Okay, so you can join your local Sierra Club, um, or Climate Action, yeah. I know they have a Prince George's um, Climate Action Committee, um, and Community Solar, where we partner with different nonprofits. So we also have a fundraiser for 501c3s who want to spread the word and sign up their people. Um, the biggest, we, we're building the largest solar farm on a landfill in Maryland, in Prince George's County. Um, and so your organization can benefit from that just by helping people spread the word. So um, that's my story. I would also say the Maryland Energy Administration, which is now housed under MDE, still takes phone calls. And they have buckets of funding for different people at different levels. So you can go, if you are a low to moderate income human, you can go and build your program. But if you are a business that serves low to moderate income folks, you can also get a specific grant to let people know that this money is available and to help them get access to it. So there are state level entities that house this information and have a communication and a community outreach mandate. So I would say every entity that is, um, Participating in third party retailing has a community outreach person. Uh, environmental organizations should have, if they don't have one, I don't know what they're doing, a community <laughs> outreach arm. And there are these agencies from the Maryland Department of Energy, Department of Natural Resources, they all have community engagement folks, but the money comes from the Maryland Energy Administration. So, on that, I'd like to thank our panelists, Jeremy, Crystal, and Matthew, for sharing information. Um, all of all of them are, they're really accessible humans. Pilfer them with questions just outside of this room. <laughs> and, and, and please do become an ambassador for Community Solar. Because ju just being in this room, you have more information than the average person might have about how it works. You should feel free to get some more of it. Thank you. <laughs>